Okay. I think it's. You put it on the group. Or on, I, on the yeah, group? I put it onto the group. I think, but it's now it's okay. redirecting. <laughs> no. I see it says streaming live to Facebook. Well, yeah, it says it. Meeting it. now streaming on Facebook. Oh, it might okay. take a minute for it to uh, update, but okay. But go ahead and record in that way. Okay, I'll record too. Okay, there's that. Oh, I see it. I see you're live. Okay. There you go. You're live <laughs> in the group. Okay, so we seem to have had a couple of Zoom glitches. It's okay. We're doing our Zoom chat. We have Barbara Taylor here, who's a speech pathologist with 30 years of experience, who's going to be helping us with all of the information we need in this pandemic situation we have where you have a child with special needs, you, you need therapy, you need education, and you're not able to go anywhere. You're stuck at home. What do you do? You're going to call somebody like Barbara, and we're going to have um, a little session here where she's going to give us some information. We'll be able to, you could still join in if you want, or you can ask your questions on Facebook, and hopefully we'll be able to get to them. Um, so pull up a chair and Barbara, get going. <laughs> All right. So every state seems to be in a little bit different status as to what whether they're um, providing services through the schools or not. And within each state, every county seems to be in a different status as well. So let me just say off the bat, um, I'm a speech pathologist and certified oral facial myologist. So I have a little bit different view than maybe some other SLPs. Um, so if you're at home with your child and perhaps they have apraxia, perhaps, perhaps they have other special needs, you have to use what you have. And hopefully you have a connection for an SLP either through your school system or a private SLP. But if you don't, um, some places that you can go, or you can go to APSPA, which is um, www.aappspa.org. And that is a group of private practice speech pathologists and audiologists across the whole country that have private practices. You can look for people in your state near you, and you can look at their experience, see what they have to offer, see if they're offering telehealth sessions. You can also go to the IOM.com, which is the International Association of Oral Facial Myologists to find an SLP. And you might find SLPs who are in both groups. There are several of us um, to connect you with someone near you to give you some strategies while you're at home in this situation. So hopefully your child already has a plan in place either from school and or privately. Um, so what you do sort of depends on where you are in the process. If you already have a speech pathologist and you're working with someone, they're probably providing telehealth services. There are lots of different platforms out there. There's Zoom, which we're on right now. There's GoToMeeting, there's TheraPlatform, there's Blink, there's a few more, there are a few more that um, there's a Google Meet and doxy.me. Some of those are HIPAA compliant, although that has been waived for this period. In my practice, we're using Zoom. We're using the professional level, the HIPAA compliant level, because we're trying to use the highest level we can. Um, so the SLP has probably chosen one of those platforms to use and will deliver therapy services via the internet to you and your child at home. So what does that look like? Well, we are still using our professional skills and knowledge about apraxia, about um, autism, about Down syndrome, any medical diagnosis and those related speech difficulties and speech swallowing language difficulties, targeting the same skills, but having 
you as the parents be our hands and actually working with the kids. And this is not really that different than what we do in our clinic because we involve the parents in every session. They're either in the session, they're watching the session on a monitor, they're participating, we're teaching them through the, set, through the monitor, we're teaching them in the session to practice these strategies with their kids at home. Because we know we don't have a magic wand. We can't just say once a week, bing, you're good. We need parents as partners to generalize these skills with kids, to practice them in functional situations. So we need to use what you have available in your home. So if there are toys that your child likes, that's great. You can use those. If you don't have a ton of toys, that's okay too. You probably have, because everybody's going through toilet paper, you probably have toilet paper tubes and paper towel tubes and spoons and pots and pans and boxes that you've Lysoled and all kinds of things that you can use at home to make your own um, adventures and make things for your kids to request. So the advice that I give depends on the child, the age of the child, the skills of the child, um, and all of those features and, and functions. So requesting is something that we often target in therapy, getting a child to request, whether it's with signs or augmented communication or word approximations. So that's a part of a word. So if they can't say bubble, they're saying ba or bubba. If they can't say car, they're saying ka or ah or some part of that, um, or using words, using word combinations. So somewhere on that um, communication spectrum, we want them to be requesting for things. So one tip is to, if you don't have a child that's going to climb, to keep things out of reach, inside out of reach, so they have to ask for it. To keep things in containers that are harder for kids to get into, so they have to ask for it. Um, to, uh, and then once they ask for it, it depends on their level of skill. If they're a new communicator, then you might have to model for them and then they make an attempt and you give it to them. If they're further along in the process, then you might have a little bit different expectation that they have to produce more of the word or you have to, they have to do a little bit more but we wanna have expectations in line with what they can do and, and what they've done before in therapy. Um, I'm a prompt trained therapist, so I use a lot of touch cues. Obviously I can't touch your child, but I prompt on myself. And many of my kids, I did this before telepractice too, and many of my kids will prompt on themselves and they don't want necessarily me to touch them, but I'll prompt and then they prompt on themselves and they're cueing them, themselves to make the sounds of the words. Um, in regards to using what you have, I have some different ideas on my Help Me Speak Facebook page that I've um, seen articles on Facebook and I've shared them on there with different things that parents can make at home. Lots of sites where you can go for a, a visual tour of something, um, free sites, for kids to engage with videos and activities and those kinds of things. What question, oh, the other thing I wanted to touch on is that if you're seeing a therapist in your state, it should be fine. If um, you're seeking a new therapist, then the current rule is that the therapist has to be licensed this is for speech pathologists. We have to be licensed in our state and then we have to be licensed in the state in which the client resides if that's their current residence. So um, feel free to contact me. I can try to help direct you to different people in your state if you don't know somebody. I'm sure at least I know some people around the country too. And so we can help kind of direct people. Um, Lisa, you had wanted me to talk about diagnosis and evaluation too. Exactly. Yeah. For children who are late talkers, don't have a diagnosis yet, and the parents are not as skilled as parents who have already experienced therapy and evaluation in person. Mm -hmm. So the, 
I mean, the evaluation is gonna look a little bit different, but the main thing that we need to find out as providers is, does the child qualify for services? Is there, is there a diagnosis? Is there some kind of difficulty? And is it medically necessary? Because that's what insurance is gonna to wanna to know. So um, we can do evaluations online. Um, it does require parent partic participation. So, you know, the therapist would prep the parent in advance. Um, they can, the evaluations will look different depending on the SLP who is conducting them. But those are the questions that have to be answered. When I do an evaluation for speech and oral motor oral swallowing in person, I take a lot of pictures. I look at structure, I look at function. Obviously I can't take quite so many pictures, but I can still look at the structure and function. I can still look at the jaw, lips and tongue. I can still have the child eat some snacks and analyze what they're doing. I can still talk to the parent about the difficulties that the child has. I can you know, take a detailed case history from the parent in advance and perhaps in a pre-session pre before the child comes in and find out that information to see if the child has some difficulties that could be addressed in therapy. So it, the format will vary a little bit depending on the therapist, their background, their skills, um, and the child and you know what difficulties the child has and what strengths the child has. But those are the main questions that we have to answer. We have to find out, um, do they qualify? Is there a medical need for services? Okay, so a question I also have is, as far as pricing goes, is it the same as it was before? And another question is, do you think this is going to change be a game changer for going ahead even after this pandemic is over do you think there's going to be more therapy um, done online because you're, we're learning something that this, there's benefits to this type of therapy mm -hmm. so i can't speak for all therapists but in our situation the pricing is the same because it still requires the skills of the therapist to analyze what's needed for that child so what are their strengths what are their needs how am I gonna help that parent with what they have in their house to facilitate communication, to facilitate improved oral motor skills, to facilitate appropriate swallowing, to facilitate appropriate nasal breathing with that child. And it actually takes more preparation for the SLP to have, usually we have you know, this much planned for the session now because we might start here and then take a detour and then go over here, which is totally fine. We're thinking about what are the main goals that we're trying to address? Is it speech production? Is it speech clarity? What oral motor skills are we trying to address in terms of lip, jaw, cheek, tongue, resting position, movement, function being most important? How are we addressing that? And, and how is the child gonna show us that? So as long as we can address those skills, which we can, um, and in my practice, we're working with kids of all different ages, all different functioning levels, and really trying to help the parents make it easier for them because we don't know when this is gonna end. I think for the future, my hope um, is that we can use this as a tool to see into families' homes to help them because for insurance, we can't go out to the home unless we're doing home health. We can't do this, the service in the home, but this is a great way to be able to have a window to see, well, what does your toy room look like? Look like? And not, not judging, I don't care if your house is clean or scattered. Everybody right now is probably living in a scattered mess. It's fine. But what do you have at home? How right. can we help you with that? That's a great, um, that's a great point. Right. That's, well, that's what I was thinking with the transition, like, you know, six months from now, eight months, a year from now, how is medicine in general going to look? And is there going to be more telepractice and more, I mean, and, and does it, do you think it does benefit you to get that insight? Like you were saying, you can't yes. see what their day-to-day -day life is. You only see that little 30 minute window of your appointment. Exactly. versus having a little more hands-on and yes maybe there will be more build hours and all of that however do you think that that will help you know um 
uh, get further into the process faster. Mm-hmm. Right. I think so. I think, I mean, there are, telepractice is not something new from our practice. I've been, I'm licensed in Maryland and Virginia. So I've been seeing clients for over a year or so um, in other locations. Um, I had in the past required that they come in for a hands-on evaluation because I do like to touch my clients and feel the muscles. But in this situation, obviously we can't. That can be one of the goals um, later on is that we can assess some other areas. Um, so it's, it's not new for us. I have clients for different reasons, even within the state of Maryland, maybe they live too far away in Maryland or they've moved. Maybe they don't have reliable transportation to get to the office consistently, or perhaps they're very, um, perhaps they have a health condition that doesn't allow them to come in contact with other people in a clinic where sometimes kids are sick and you know, they might be exposed to things even on a normal basis. So I have some clients that we have been seeing previous to this online. My hope is that it will continue. And if, for example, let's say the baby in the family is sick, but the mom is not sick, the child is not sick, um, and the child can still participate in therapy and the mom, can, the mom or the dad can be there with the parent, then they can still get benefit from their session. They can still have their session and maybe the other parent can take care of the other sick family member. Let's say the car breaks down, then we can still have a session. Um, let's say there's a snowstorm and the power doesn't go out, <laughs> the power's still on, internet's still on, then we can have a session. So those are the uses that, that I was hoping to um, use with certain insurances before. I'm lucky in that my area, um, Blue Cross, which is one of the major insurances we take, has previously allowed telehealth. I would say most insurances are allowing it now. They're sort of coming on board. It does depend on your state. It does depend on your plan. If you're not sure, you can always call, but just know that you might get different answers on different days. Because I don't think that all of the people who answer the phone have been given all the information yet. I think it's still emerging. Well, there's another question I have. I know when Tanner was in therapy, I always liked to be in the session. I felt like I could learn more in the session. I'm actually thinking with this type of practice, I, I think it would be good if there was kind of that combination where you could, you know, like you said, if you needed to assess, but I'm kind of thinking it's going to make us as the parents a little bit more involved as a team with you. So like when you were saying with prompt where the kids touch themselves, also teaching the moms, like how to do it, not obviously not that they're going to be there, mm-hmm. prompt, but like get, having them as part of the team, it's going to have this new group of parents coming up who are a little bit more skilled, even than we had to be as parents that didn't use telepractice, you know? So obviously this, this would have been great for me when I had two special needs kids. I mean, to be able to do this and not have to, you know, both of them, um, you know, the one had eating and breathing problems and going in the car and driving. This is way easier. Mm -hmm. Clearly. (laughs) I agree. And I, I think, you know, obviously with some kids, it's much better to be there, but this is sort of, unfortunately it's forcing parents to really get involved in the session. And I think most parents already are involved. Like you said, Lisa, they're either watching on the monitor right. or they're in the session with the child. And that's what we require. We, I want them participating in any way possible. If they have siblings with them and the siblings would be distracting to the child, then they watch from the waiting room on the monitor. Um, or if not, then they're in the session and they're watching and we're talking to them through the monitor and saying, okay, mom, so now at home, I want you to do this. And if you can't see, come on in and I'll show you on you. Um, but it's, these are things that we're, we've been asking our parents to do all along anyway, because my rule of thumb is I don't require parents to do something or try something until it's easy enough for the child to not get super frustrated because if they're gonna have a meltdown every single time, we have to find another way to get there. We can't, we can't, we wanna keep increasing the bar, but we don't wanna start up here and have a very, very frustrated child and parent. 
we have to build. And so we send home exercises and tools and, and fun things to do once they're getting the idea of it. So through telehealth sessions, we can help them get the idea of it and then give them suggestions just as we normally would. Here's what to do next. Here's what to practice at home. So one other thing before we finish, cause I wanna try to keep this like uh, to a half an hour and fun for everybody, um, educational, informative mm -hmm. is, I know education is the other aspect. So we, we address those younger children and how we get them evaluated when they've never been to an SLP. Now you have a child who maybe the therapist isn't up to speed like you. Like that's the reason I wanted you to be the speaker because you are already a yeah. telepractice therapist already. So you're skilled at this. Um, what do they do? They're not in Maryland. They're not in Virginia. I know they can contact you for help. But as far as like addressing how you help those parents who are in school and maybe they need some extra help in schoolwork and they're also getting therapy and how the two are combined with telepractice and how SLPs are involved. Cause I know, I know with my kids, like speech pathology and education kind of sometimes comes together in the school years. So what SLPs typically do in private practice, how we're a little bit different than the school SLP, is that we can also address the medical aspects of speech, language, and swallowing difficulties. In the school, as we're all aware, it has to um, negatively affect the educational performance okay. for a child to get services. We try to coordinate with the school SLP as much as possible so we're on the same page if we're working or requesting that we're both working on the same, the same word level. If we're working on language that we're working on the same types of targets, but in different, you know, in slightly different toys or activities so that the child is not getting confused. Um, if we're working on sound targets that we're working on the same sounds and we're on the same page so the child isn't getting rhetorically confused. So that's what I would say is that um, I would hope that the school and the private SLPs could join together and collaborate as we have in the past and help each other with how best to help the child. Um, do, you have, do you have the, the school therapist on in the meeting sometimes with you? So it's you, the school therapist, the parent. That's, that's pretty awesome. If, if that's allowed, I mean, right now in my county um, where we reside, the school doesn't go back until next week for high school then the following week for middle school. And I think they're still figuring it out for elementary and beyond. And there are so many moving parts. I'm glad I don't have to make those decisions. I think it's a, it's definitely a challenge on both ends, but we can, yeah, we can definitely help. I mean, we can help. Um, and there, I am, I, through my network of other professionals, I know people around the country, maybe not in every city, but hopefully I can point someone in. Come on, Barbara, get on. Um, hopefully I can point parents in a direction for someone near them who is skilled, who is trained. And if they don't accept their insurance or they can't help them, they can point them to somebody else. So hopefully we can link them with someone who can help them um, and who is doing telepractice. Will you also let us know if it changes where you don't have to be licensed in that city because it kind of like defeats the purpose of telepractice. We have parents from other countries, for example, who are in areas of the world where there's very few SLPs. So mm -hmm. it should be that if you're able to, you have the time and ability, you should be able to help. It's telepractice. It's the internet. You should be able to help them if they need help. It depends. So if they're in another country, it depends on that country's rules and licensure. For some countries, there are associations like speech pathology associations, national ones. And so it would depend on if there are licensure laws or you know what that says. Um, I don't know enough about every single country, but some of that information is on ASHA. And as speech pathologists, we could research for families and find out and see what's available. But laws are changing all the time. I and mean, right. when I came back- Especially from college, now. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I think this that, might Right, I, everything's adapting faster because yeah. you know like it's obviously needed. Well, I wouldn't mm -hmm. say it's exact. Well, it's not always fast with insurance, but <laughs> we are catching up. 
or red tape with the government. So we we yeah. did have one Facebook comment on Facebook, Raquel. She didn't ask a question, but she said that she did. They started um, OT online yesterday. So great. Yeah. That's yeah, another that. good thing. Do you ever work together with the, because I always love when the speech pathologists and occupational therapists work together. So you have you, SLP, OT, and the, in the one room. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Currently, I don't have an OT or PT <laughs> staff, but that is one of my goals um, is to add that service. And now with the change in service delivery, that might be another possibility. I really do hope that some of these um, boundaries that have shifted continue to be available and open because I think that having a skilled and licensed professional is key. I don't think we should undercut that. I don't think that we should. I know that there are areas that don't have enough speech pathologists, but I'd rather see the licensure rules change in terms of between states than saying that just anybody can do it because I, you know, our education is pretty significant. We do go through our full four years of college and then have our master's. And then many of us have a ton of continuing education. I have 13 ACEs, which is 70 hours in a three year period or faster. Can you very quickly share, because I know I wrote it in just before we finish up, like what your background is, because it is extensive and it's not just a praxy autism. I mean, you deal with oral motor, you're skilled in above the level of most SLPs. So, and there are a few of us like this around the country. Um, so I've been an SLP, I think 29 years this year. So pretty close. Um, and I've worked in a lot of different settings. I've worked in schools, I've worked in nursing homes, I've worked in hospitals, rehab, outpatient, home care with adults, home care with pediatrics. I think what I might be forgetting. I think the only place I haven't worked is maybe a NICU, potentially. Um, so, and I've worked with a lot of different diagnoses. I've always been interested and fascinated with the medical aspect of speech pathology, how the muscles work, how they respond to treatment. So I've always kind of taken that aspect, looked at that, I'm fascinated with the brain. So I've worked with speech, articulation, sound production, stuttering, um, auditory process, processing, language, comprehension, expression, all of the basic things. But then in addition, um, I am a certified oral facial myologist which is a mouthful, but it means that I treat the muscles in the face and the mouth and how they rest, how they move for speech, potentially, that's not always an issue, and how they function. And thinking about the muscles in relation to airway and sleep as well. Um, and so I also work with swallowing, I work with picky eaters. Um, I see a lot of kids that have tongue ties. It's very important when looking at kids that have been diagnosed with apraxia to rule out any structural difficulties. And coexisting diagnosis. Cause I yes. actually did one little video on, you know, parents get so hung up on one type of therapy. It's gotta be prompt or it's gotta be whatever. And I found therapists like you who are skilled in numerous areas. So like, in other words, you need to know what to pull out of your little toolbox. Like it may not work. Oral motor therapy may be great for one area, but it may not be great for another. So if you have a child with apraxia and dysarthria, you may address that from two different angles, two different distinct therapy models. So why not to get stuck in, you know, with one type of therapy? You have to be eclectic. I mean, I've always right. said that the child didn't read the book. They didn't know they're supposed to act a certain way. So you have to be able to think outside the box and you have to throw the box away. There, there's really no cookbook type therapy um, that's gonna work the same for every child. So even with oral motor exercises and, and skills, I mean, tools are great and I use lots of tools. I use some that are disposable, some that we clean, but when the child can't do what I want them to do, I'm thinking, well, what is my ultimate goal? Am I working on lip rounding? Am I working on gathering the chewed food? Am I working on chewing the food? What am I working on? What is my goal? And how can I get there a different way? 
So if they can't do this, that's okay. Cause you know, bubble blowing is great, but I'm not working on bubble blowing for that sake. I'm working on maybe lip rounding. I'm working on maybe graded airway control. So what is the end goal? And then how do you get there? And how can you figure out a different way to help that child? Well, maybe what we'll do is uh, one other time because you probably covered a few things that we can go more in depth into another little coffee chat and sure. we can go more into like, you know, as people are looking for different things. Um, I really want to thank you so much, Barbara, for your time today during our pandemic. Sure, no problem. <laughs> and, and Julie, you know, Julie's our vice president for those that have never met Julie Abreu. So president, vice president, and amazing Barbara Taylor. Um, mm -hmm. Next week, we're going to have on the executive director of the Clean Label Project. Um, and she is going, she's amazing as well. And this, she's going to talk the same talk she's giving to us. She just presented to the United Nations. Um, and yeah, so it, it should be very fascinating. She's going to talk about heavy metals in food and how they affect our children and, and all of that. So um, Rachel is going to be next week. Uh, sorry, not Rachel. I'm thinking of somebody yeah. else. Jackie. Jackie. Yeah. Jackie. <laughs> no, so, that's, that's gonna be fun I'm, I'm looking forward to that not that I wasn't looking forward to hearing you Barbara so far these have been fun core of like our whole group I mean Jackie is is going to be more of a fringe and I know that Barbara you're also very focused on nutrition and the gut brain connection and all of that and that's one of the things that we're going to talk about next week so I know you're going to want to join in as well so yeah well, thank you sense. everybody and thank you, Barbara um, if anybody is listening and they have any further questions, just leave it underneath the live and um, Barbara will be able to answer it. If, if I didn't answer it, I, I tried to think of everything somebody would probably bring up, but. No, know. it was great. It was great and perfect. And we're right at 30 minutes. So of being like recording and live. So I, I'm you. trying to stick to the 30 minutes. Cause I know people are yeah, crazy right now. So, all yeah. right. Let me know if there's any other questions, let me know, Lisa. Okay. okay. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Have a Bye. great Bye. day. <laughs> Bye.